Well, it's really good to be here this morning. I think my talk is going to represent um, a completely different side to the work that fellows at GTC have been doing. Um, as in my introduction, so I'm one of the teaching fellows at college and I actually graduated from GTC almost 10 years ago now. So GTC is very fond, holds a very fond place in my heart. And so at the beginning of the, uh, at the, beginning of the pandemic in, in February last year, I actually started my PhD and it was meant to be on hepatitis B sequencing in sub-Saharan Africa. So you can imagine um, the COVID pandemic swiftly changed the topic and the virus I was um, working on um, and I, I swiftly switched back over um, to COVID research and I actually redeployed to the NHS um, for four months um, partway through my DPhil and then returned back um, and, and now I'm um, focusing my research exclusive, exclusively on SARS-CoV-2 and so I've been working in a, in a, in a huge multidisciplinary team up in the hospital um, with really strong collaborative links between the um, clinical staff and the university. And I'm just going to present a really small fraction of the work we've been doing over the last year, focusing on the OUH staff testing that we set up last March. Um, so the research I'm going to present today is going to focus on three questions that we tried to ask and answer. So the first one of these that we were looking at right at the beginning of the pandemic is we wanted to know which of our staff were at the highest risk of COVID-19 infection. The second question we wanted to ask was how long do antibodies last? And I guess we're interested in this um, as a proxy for immunity um, and also because antibody prevalence is one of the, the key inputs into a lot of epidemiological models that are being used to kind of model the pandemic and our um, get out strategies. And the third question we were uh, wanting to answer was, can you catch SARS-CoV-2 more than once? So as I mentioned, um, this research was based on the OUH staff testing. Um, so OUH covers four sites in Oxfordshire in the UK, over a thousand beds, and we have over 13 and a half thousand staff who rotate around the different hospitals. Um, in our study of healthcare workers that I'm going to present today, healthcare worker is defined as anyone on site. So it doesn't have to be a nurse, a doctor, an HCA. It could, for example, include the porters, domestic staff. So anyone working in, on site in, one, in one of our four hospitals. Um, and what we did was we started offering testing to our staff. So this formed um, two kinds of clinics. So the first was symptomatic testing for symptomatic staff staff which was set up by the occupational health department at the end of March and this um, involved a PCR test so in this picture on the top left um, a swab and a PCR test um, for anyone with symptoms of cough fever and osmia but then later on in April at the same time when the government was getting pretty stressed that they weren't meeting their 100,000 tests a day target um, suddenly some money became available for us to increase our testing capacity. So we used this to set up an asymptomatic testing um, clinic, which involves staff being invited for PCR tests every two weeks and serology every two months. Um, and so, so um, we, um, I basically set up these clinics, uh, the asymptomatic staff testing clinics, and remember being given the challenge of basically finding 60 people to staff these clinics overnight. So I'm forever grateful to the fantastic students, the medical students at GTC, who massively bailed us out and have ha played the most fantastic role in, in enabling us to set up staff testing at OUH. So um, between the symptomatic and asymptomatic staff testing, we've now screened over 13 and a half um, members of staff. And because of rotations of particularly doctors in and out of Oxford, we've actually got 16,000 staff members enrolled in, and tested in our clinics. So the first study I wanted to present, answering the question of who is most at risk of infection, um, we did um, looking at our first three months of data. So on the top right here, I've got the epidemiological curve, uh, basically of the pandemic showing the number of inpatient cases, just to give you an idea of what period of time I'm talking about. I've indicated in the red box here, this, this is the first wave, this data is um, presented based on the first wave of information. So in, in this study, we looked at uh, over 10,000 staff um, 
for, who had attended symptomatic and asymptomatic staff testing. And in the bottom um, graph here, you can see the number of um, weeks progressing over time on the x-axis and number of staff diagnoses on the y-axis. And you can see the rise and fall of cases um, um, very closely mirrors the national picture of the rise and fall of cases in the first wave. And we found that in this first wave, compared to a national seroprevalence of just under 7%, the uh, seroprevalence in our staff was just over 11%, and that was a combined seroprevalence and antibody positive rate. So we could see that our, our, our staff seemed to be at higher risk of COVID-19 compared to the general population. So this is obviously concerning to us because, um, you know, as a, as a trust, we want to be protecting our staff and we don't want to be um, putting them at unnecessary risk of infection. So we wanted to look a bit more closely at this data to find out what the main risk factors for infection were. And so um, we looked at multiple different variables. So we wanted to ask, was, was the, the riskiest thing working at a hospital? Or was actually the riskiest thing being in contact with someone at COVID, uh, with COVID at home? Did it matter what ward you were working in within that hospital? Did it matter what your occupation was? Um, did it matter if you were COVID um, facing or non-COVID facing? Did it matter what ethnicity you were? Um, and so we basically put all these different factors into a model to see which were the most significant factors, risk factors for infection in our staff. And I think we all thought that, you know, who's gonna be most at risk? It's gonna be, it's got to be those ITU, you know, nurses who are kind of interact, you know, and the HDU nurses who are kind of really up close with these patients' airways, the really sick patients who, who are, kind of intubated, it's got to be those staff members who are at most at risk of infection. So that's what we thought we were going to see. Actually, that's not what we saw. Um, so we actually found that the strongest um, risk factor for our staff members was being, in, um, a house, being a household contact of someone who was known to be SARS-CoV-2 SARS positive with an adjusted odds ratio of 4.8. So they were almost five times as likely um, to acquire COVID if they had a household contact versus non-household contact. The next most um, predictive single factor was whether they had a COVID-19 facing role or not. So for example, a nurse working on a COVID-19 um, cohort ward would count as a COVID-19 facing role, whereas an um, admin staff solely working in um, an office would be non-COVID-19 facing. Um, the third most predictive factor was um, um, the person's occupation. And interestingly, and I'll show you another graph in a, in a second, it wasn't the ITU doctors or the anaesthetists or the HDU teams who were high at risk. It was actually the porters and cleaners. Um, we're not saying this is necessarily risk acquired, uh, you know, solely from the hospital. And there are obviously other socioeconomic factors in, in play here. But it was a, a kind of a really big wake up lesson for us to realise that we do have large groups of staff members who are at significant risk of um, contracting COVID-19 and access to testing um, is really important in these staff groups. And finally, we did notice um, a significant effect of um, ethnicity. So black and Asian staff members were significantly more likely to be um, to have had COVID-19 than white staff members. So just um, to dig into the speciality and occupation a bit further. So this is a graph showing percentage of each staff group who um, had had previous evidence of COVID-19. And here on the left hand side in the pink bar, you can see the porter and domestic staff were at highest, highest risk, followed by the physios, OTs and speech and language therapists, which you can kind of see there's a, um, they work very closely with patients on all, all sorts of, of wards, and then the nurses and HCAs. And then if we move on to the next slide, this is split by speciality, and you can see um, the intensive um, care doctors are kind of way down the, the risk um, group, and anaesthetics is far on the right-hand side. So although these were often the most anxious and nervous special, specialities, it, it kind of demonstrates that the PPE packages that are in place within these teams, a level two PPE, they had specific donning and doffing rooms and teams. They would have, um, they employed medical students to observe staff members donning and doffing. Everything was done very carefully um, by the book. So, so those PPE packages worked really well 
Um, what we what we saw was actually the highest risk was in in the kind of un, unselected medical take where you didn't necessarily know that your patient had COVID when you were seeing them. It was fine by the time they got to ITU because they had a COVID-19 diagnosis. But in general medicine, a lot of staff were seeing patients who didn't have their PCR results. At the beginning of the pandemic, universal PP was not in place. And so a lot of staff were exposed um, early on in the pandemic. It's interesting, I don't know if there's any trauma and orthopaedics people listening in now, but trauma and orthopaedics scored pretty high on this. This, is, this wasn't actually due to um, um, a high number of patients um, um, providing high infectious pressure. This was actually um, an office outbreak that um, accounted for that high um, seroprevalence here. So yeah, I think this, this um, really woke us up to the fact it kind of was was very good to see how well the packages, the IPC packages um, for ICU um, and the anaesthetists were working really well, but it really woke us up to the fact that we needed to really look at and protect some staff groups such as the ports and domestic staff. Um, it was really helpful in informing our staff risk assessment. Um, it spurred us on to improve the te testing access to the non-clinical non roles. Um, we started translating the PPE guidance into other languages. A lot of um, the portering and domestic staff um, speak Tetum and not very good English. Um, so we've translated all of the PPE guidance into multiple languages, including Tetum, Spanish. Um, and it also helped us to reinforce to our staff that it's not just your work, which is risky in terms of acquiring COVID-19, you know, home contacts uh, and what you do outside of work. Uh, um, are really important too. So that was the first study from the first three months of data. Um, the second question we wanted to ask was how long do antibodies last? So all the staff members, well most of the staff members coming through the asymptomatic staff testing clinic were pretty keen to get their um, antibodies tested. We test on two platforms, one um, looks for an anti-spike antibody and the other one looks for an anti-nucleocapsid antibody. The anti-nucleocapsid platform is um, a commercial platform um, that we use from Abbott at Antispike was one developed um, by the Therapeutic Drugs Institute TDI in Oxford. Um, and so our second paper looked at um, 3,276 serially, serially tested staff. Um, and we looked at them uh, between March and October. So this um, diagram on the bottom right, just indicating the window we're looking at. So it's mainly the first first wave and then a little bit of um, creeping up into the second wave in October. So we wanted to know how long do antibodies last and why are we interested in that really for two reasons. One because you, you kind of feel that maybe it should give you some kind of indication about whether someone is going to be immune although the correlates of immunity are not well established and um, but also as I mentioned previously um, seroprevalence in cohorts is used in all the, the main epidemiological models um, uh, to determine, you know, how we get out of lockdown, etc. Um, so um, these are the results from the two different tests that I mentioned. So the, the Abbott anti-nucleopsid IgG test on the left and the anti-spike IgG nucleopsid test on the right. And it shows the number of staff members remaining positive over time. And you can see the trajectories of these graphs are really different, which was actually quite surprising. I think, I think we'd imagine that, you know, antibody tests are, are going to behave in broadly similar ways. But you can see that the antibody that the Abbott architect is detecting seems to fall relatively quickly over time. Whereas looking at the anti-spike IgG, that remains relatively stable over time. Now, it's pretty tricky to interpret what this actually means because the way the cutoffs of low, medium, high have been set up on these assays mean that this fall here doesn't necessarily mean a huge drop in, in antibody, uh, antibody le levels. So it's all pretty complicated, basically. But what I think it did highlight is you've got to know um, what your antibody test is detecting and whether it's likely to fall over time. For example, if you were going to do a seroprevalence study with this Abbott test, you know that you know over half the people you test, if they've had the infection more than 180 days ago, are gonna test negative. So that's gonna give you a completely different idea of seroprevalence. 
versus if you use this anti-spike IgG, where you know over 90% of people remain positive at 180 days. And this is just showing you what happens by age group. Um, so the different colors represent different age bands. And we can see, and this, this shows the rate of um, kind of fall of the anti-nucleopsid IgG. And it shows you, so the kind of over 60s fall less fast than the, the, than the under 20s. So, so the younger you are, the faster the tighter of this antibody seems to fall. And this again would have a, a big impact. So if you were gonna do um, a, a serious survey using this um, Abbott test, you're gonna underestimate the seroprevalence in the younger people versus the older people. So you've just gotta be aware that if you're gonna use this test, you know, the, the faults in the data you're gonna get. So the implications of this were, it's really essential to understand the acid dependent rates of decline. And I think this is a common theme for everything that is said about COVID testing in the media. It's often presented like there's one PCR test or there's one antibody test or there's one lateral flow test, but there's not. There's hundreds of everything. And to, uh, to be able to understand the test results you've got in front of you, you need to know what platform it's um, being done on. Uh, we, you need to know what phase and disease you're talking about. And, and you need to know the metrics of, of that each assay to be able to um, understand what's going on. And I, do, I don't think that's very well portrayed in the media how how complex this is um so yeah we saw that antibody levels um using the anti-spike i say do remain positive 180 days after infection but what we really wanted to know was what this meant for immunity so this led us on to our third study um, so looking at antibody states and instance of SARS-CoV-2 infection in the healthcare workers, which was published in New England Journal of Medicine. Um, and so um, these are some pictures taken from the New England Journal of Medicine um, um, uh, visual abstract that you can watch the whole video, two minutes of it on their website. Um, so that explains the pretty funky colours. Um, so our study this time was of 12,541 uh, healthcare workers and by that point 11,364 were seronegative and 1,177 were seropositive and 88 seroconverted within the time frame of the study. And this study was performed looking at data for, from the onset of staff testing clinics in March up until the 30th of November. So just shown in that graph on the bottom right now. And so in this study, um, we were um, looking at people's antibody results and their PCR results. And we um, split the staff into two groups, those who were antibody negative and antibody positive and followed them up over time. So for the antibody negative cohort, we followed them up for 200 days. Uh, and the antibody positive cohort, we followed them for, this graph is actually wrong, 140 days at risk after their um, positive antibody test. And what we see here, so is in the seronegative um, group on the left-hand side here, we saw loads of infections, as you might expect. Um, so we, we saw 120 um, people infected picked up through the asymptomatic screening route and 99 picked up through the symptomatic um, screening group. But in the seropositive group, we only saw two staff members infected. And actually, when we dug into the, um, those people's results, it either looked like they had had a false positive antibody result in the past, or a false positive PCR result in the past. So actually those, those two who looked like they had been re reinfected in the seropositive group really didn't have very good evidence of reinfection. And so we, when we compare the incident rate ratio of cases in the seronegative group versus the seropositive group, um, we can see that the seronegative people are 10 times more likely to get infected than seropositive people. And so we were the first group in the world to, to show that previous infection protects you against um, subsequent reinfection. And, you know, I think it was, I can't remember if it was reviewer one or reviewer two of the paper said, <laughs> their review was, this is not groundbreaking research. And you're like, we, we, well, it, it's, not, it's not a surprising result. And it's completely true. This is not a surprising result, but just no one had managed, no one had the data together. No one had managed to actually show that having an infection once gave you immunity to being infected again. So it was really great that, you know, um, the staff testing um, could produce this kind of really fundamental result. Um, 
so this is just another way of showing the two results. So this is a graph on the x-axis. You've got the calendar, calendar risk at times. So you can see the kind of end of the first wave at the beginning and the beginning of the second wave at the end. And this is the estimated instance of PCR positive results for 10,000 healthcare workers on the y-axis. And the red line is those without antibodies and the blue line is those with, anti with antibodies. And you can see there's just a big difference in the the rate of case acquisition and this is controlled for time age participant reported gender and we saw similar things whether we were measuring the anti-spike antibodies that i mentioned before or the anti-nucleocapsid antibodies so the implications for this so as i said the first group to show that the presence of anti-spike or anti-nucleopsid IgG antibodies was associated with a substantially reduced risk of COVID-2 infection in the ensuing six months. But there are obviously many more questions to ask and answer about this. So how long does this protection last? What about the elderly or the children? Because our population is predominantly working aged people with a few League of Friends volunteers who budge up our um, <laughs> maximum age a little bit. Um, and what about the immunosuppressed? You know, the majority of our staff members are um, um, don't have kind of, I mean, well, the, the, all staff members who have been at work were not staff members who are severely immunosuppressed and shielding. So what about those populations who are severely immunosuppressed? What happens with immunity in them? Are they more likely to catch COVID twice? So those are the three main studies that I wanted to present. I just thought I'd tell you for a minute about some of the sequencing work we're going to be doing. And it's not quite sequencing beetles in Borneo, which sounds really exciting, but we are still making similar family trees of the viruses that we're finding. Um, uh, so, so what I've been doing over the last two months is basically setting up um, near real time sequencing of SARS-CoV-2 up in the JR. So this is me on level seven of the um, JR in our tiny little sequencing room um, and on the top right we've got one of the sequencing machines that we're using um, and it's a nanopore platform and these tiny three tiny little things the tiny little flow cells are the kind of smaller than a mobile phone and that's what does all the, the business does all the sequencing and um, so there's there's two main projects that I've been setting up and, and, and I'm working on so one question is asking about um, uh, staff and patient acquisition of SARS-CoV-2. So if we use sequencing to read the genetic sequence of the viruses, we can see how closely related two viruses are. And if we can see two viruses identical, we start to think, well, you know, did those people to pass, pass it to each other? So we're interested in looking at, at staff to staff transmission, patient to patient transmission, and transmission between patient and staff. So seeing if we can combine the epidemiological data from, from bed and ward move data um, together with the sequencing data kind of to better understand nosocomial transmission of SARS-CoV-2. And the second um, thing that it's been really useful for is so uh, obviously you've heard in the news about all these, um, the identif identification of new variants um, and concerns about whether these are going to be able to evade naturally induced immunity or vaccine induced immunity. So we're working in really close collaboration with um, Gavin Screeton in the, in the university. Um, um, and we're able to identify staff or patients who have um, variants of concern um, and highlight to him samples um, which are useful to um, be then cultured to, uh, and then we can test to see whether vaccine and naturally induced immune responses are, are likely to still be effective. And then we'll, we're using sequencing to look at those staff members and patients who um, have become positive despite having had infection before and despite having been vaccinated to see if there's any unique viral signatures which could be um, causing problems in the future with an immune escape. So that's it um, in terms of my talk. I just wanted to say thank you to all the staff members who have um, come and been tested in these clinics, over 16,000, it's been a pretty big mission. And these are just a few of the people that have been involved. So in the top right here, this is the team on level seven who run the robot, who, which has been doing a lot of the serology. Um, in the bottom right here, that's one of the symptomatic um, testing clinics run by Occupational Health. So it's like a drive-by in the car park. 
Uh, in the middle here, this is um, some of my team of medical students, so in our clinic in the Churchill. Um, but there is there's literally, I mean, over 150 staff, me uh, staff members we've recruited to run these clinics. It's been a phenomenal effort. And then and, and on the left hand side here are the con consultants who have mainly been supervising me on the project. So David Ed, Derek Crook, Philippa Matthews, Denise O'Donnell, Tim Pito, Katie Jeffrey, Tim Walker and Nicole Stoza. Um, so yeah, it's been a fantastic opportunity for me, not really the defil I expected, um, but a fantastic opportunity for me to, to kind of meet loads of people, get stuck in with loads of projects and um, generate some interesting results. So yeah, that's it.